now our science slam. So welcome to the first Polish science slam ever. Uh, we have six courageous contestants who have lined up there and can't wait to present themselves. How is this going to run? I'll introduce each of them very briefly, and then they have exactly four minutes to pitch their research topic to you. And of course, you'll, you're supposed to give them a big round of applause when they're done. And then in the end, we'll take a vote. There will be first a test vote to see if you are capable of accessing the voting site and will practice a little bit. And then we'll take the real vote and determine the winner. And the winner will, of course, receive a small prize. OK, so let's get started then. Our first contestant is uh, Li Ping Wang. She obtained a PhD at the Institute of Chemistry at the Chinese Academy of Sciences and worked on lithium metal batteries then. Um, she is now a postdoc in Max Fichtner's group. And uh, she said, well, she really likes challenges. So that's why she chose multivalent metal batteries as a research topic in Max Fichtner's group, mostly, fo mostly focusing on magnesium sulfur batteries as a research topic. She has no experience in science slams, she told me, and in fact, just last week noticed what she got herself into. But I'm very happy that she's still willing to come to the stage and talk to us about inhibition of polysulfide shuttles in magnesium sulfur batteries, modified separators, and gel polymer electrolytes. The stage is yours, sleeping. Let's give her a round of applause to encourage her. And your time starts. Now. Inside magnesium sulfur battery, there are mainly magnesium anode and sulfur cathode. Between them, it's separator. We know that both the magnesium and sulfur has high abundance and also have high theoretical capacities. But things are always not so perfect. When the sulfur, uh, when we talk about the sulfur cathode, it may form the soluble species called polysulfide which can dissolve into the electrolyte and shuttle through the separator to the anode part, which people call this polysulfide shuttle. When we're taking the polysulfide as the SpongeBob, he really enjoys playing inside the electrolyte ocean. And sometimes he even thinks that the magnesium anode is his pineapple house. But for the magnesium sulfur battery, the story is not so inspiring. When the magnesium polysulfide reaches the magnesium surface, it may passivate the surface and, and cause some detrimental effect on the magnesium stripping plating, even leading to the battery failure. Then we need to think about what should we do with this? Don't forget, between the electrodes, there's still an important part, separator. Here we use a functionalized separator with the molybdenum sulfide, which also called shuffle phase, coated on the surface of the separator close to the cathode part. When we take the shuffle phase as Patrick, what will SpongeBob choose? Let's imagine it's freedom or his best friend. Based on our experiment, he chose Patrick, as always. The shuffle phase can stop the polysulfide shuttle and also provide an improved columbic efficiency and also improve the uh, extended cycle life. Then we need to think about what kind of role Patrick do? <laughs> like what's the relationship between them? Based on our XPS and the DFT calculations, we found that the polysulfide, uh, the shuffle phase has a dual role First of all, it can, uh, has a high affinity towards the polysulfide, which can suppress the polysulfide migration. More importantly, it can also has a catalytic effect, which can facilitate the polysulfide transformation. It's just, uh, so in summary, the shuffle phase can on one hand accept the polysulfide, and on the other hand, uh, facilitate the polysulfide re redox reaction. It's just a true friend who can accept who you are and also helps you become who you should be. <laughs> Thanks a lot.
Very good. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Just three minutes. Let's see how much time the others need. Okay. We move on to, on to the next candidate. The next candidate is um, Hui Ting Liu. Um, she did her Bachelor's of Engineering and Energy Technology in Tongji University in China, and then a Master's degree at uh, RWTH Aachen. And she is now active in Research Unit D of our cluster, working as a PhD student in Marcel Weil's group at the um, ITAS, Institute for Technikfolgenabschätzung, uh, where she works on the sustainability assessment of anode materials. And today she's going to talk to us in the next four minutes about life cycle assessment of hard carbon anode materials. Let's also give her a round of applause. And when you are, oh, now the four minutes were over, it's so, okay. Um, how do I stop this? All right. So, um, sorry. I have to reset it and your time starts now. So after visiting the labs, I'm quite jealous that you can work with the air conditioners in the, uh, such a luxury building. Actually, yesterday was really, really hot, and we have had the first um, hot weather in this summer. And um, many scientific science has already proven that um, the more and more um, um, extreme hot weather is caused by the global warming, global warming impacts. So, um, in the police project, we are working together to um, have a, to develop a more sustainable and environmental friendly battery system. And the, from that, our first my, our, our first thought would be to eliminate the global warming impacts and to. Um, uh, and to emit less CO2. However, global warming won't be the, f the only impact we consider. We also need to reserve the um, resources and also to eliminate, el eliminate other toxicity for the future and for a sustainable development. However, for the hard carbon, um, it is a uh, it is a technology still in the uh, early phase of development. Mm. Sorry. Um, to reduce those impacts, we want to use the life cycle assessment, which is a methodology that consider um, the whole life cycle of the battery production from the resource extraction to the end of life. And we will... Um, um, evaluate those impacts in a quanti quantitative manner um, and to identify the hot spots where we can um, making changes which could have the most um, reduction of the impacts. However, for the hard carbon, it is, a, it is a technology which is still in the early phase. So we are facing the dilemma that has already been introduced by Dr. Baumann before. We have a dilemma that we need the data to perform the LCA on the industrial scale. However, we are still lacking of the um, data because we still don't have a fully commercialized production line of the hard carbon. So we are um, developing a prospective LCA framework that can upscale the manufacture, manufacturing of hard carbon and to evaluate the um, environmental impact in the industrial scale by using the data from the laboratory scale. We are doing this by putting together the uh, simulation tool which can simulate the in, the energy and material impacts in the industrial scale with the upscaling effects which can be validated by the um, laboratory data sets. And this, this allows us to identify the hotspots to reduce the environmental impact in hot, hot carbon production and to screen the, the proper uh, raw material for the hot carbon production. This can be also extended to other carbon materials such as graphite and sodium and, and soft carbon and um, because of the similar upscaling effects and the similar process, um, process um, roads. So um, 
we hope using this framework we can develop a better anode material. All right, perfectly on time. Thank you very much. All right, next person is Matthias Uhl. Matthias um, studied chemistry here in Ulm and he's doing his PhD in Timo Jakobs' group um, now um, and works on sodium deposition from non aqueous electrolytes. Um, he already once participated in the science slam, he told me, and received the mixed blessing from another student who said, Oh, I didn't know you could be funny. Um, so I think he's going to try it again, and he's talking about um, sodium borohydrate for sodium deposition. Can a reducing agent also reduce our problems? So looking forward to it, and your time starts now. Thank you, Christian. So I would like to take you on a short journey uh, how I got to uh, sodium borohydrides for sodium deposition. So how my personal mission on sodium deposition started, and as for all of you, I guess, it started with reading a lot of literature. And after reading, of course, I tried and tried and tried, and after a while, yes, I succeeded in getting a good cyclic photomogram with high deposition currents for sodium and also very good reversibility. So I was quite happy, and I could say that's the end of my mission. No, of course not. Because this is already known in literature, and now the science starts. And science, and especially battery science, is quite complex, as you know. So I would like to pick one of these aspects, which is exchanging the electrolyte salt. So I start with sodium hexafluorophosphate, which works really nice. And I would like to exchange it in the first step to, uh, with sodium TFSI, but unfortunately, not very nice. So you see the currents are decreasing, reversibility is decreasing. I was not happy about this. So again, I started to try a lot and after a while, yes, a sign of hope. So I could achieve a cyclic photomogram with high currents and okay-ish reversibility, but it was in a three electrode setup uh, and at quite fast cycling speed and after quite some conditioning. So how to get that into batteries? Because in batteries, we have only two electrodes and we need high activity right from the beginning. So I thought, okay, faster cycling and two electrode setups, that's easy. So I just tried, but yeah, obviously that didn't, uh, that didn't work out. So how could I improve this? And the easiest answer is ask for help. And the guy who helped me in this case was Benjamin. He's a magnesium expert in our group in the electrochemistry, and he's also a member of Polis, so you can visit him at his poster this evening. And he told me, ah, in magnesium deposition, we know that borohydrides are excellent. So they help to reduce the water content and maybe also reduce problems. And they can somehow change the surface to enhance the deposition and the solution. And you might know this cyclic photomogram because it was uh, done in Polis. So some of you are already uh, are even here today. And you see with the borohydrides, the red line, the deposition currents are way higher than without and the reversibility looks quite good. A similar effect is also seen in ionic liquids and this was also a part of Polis, so quite nice. So why not trying also sodium borohydrides for sodium deposition? Uh, and I did. So I start again with this CV and I added sodium borohydride. And yeah, okay. It's at least a little better. So it's not the end of all problems, but it's one step in the right direction. So I have three key messages besides the science to you because I found it really valuable. So please talk to each other. You have excellent colleagues here sitting next to you within the cluster. Think outside your box and please do not give up. So with this, I would like to thank you and also my coworkers and wish you good luck for your research. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matthias. Okay, so the next talk is actually given by Mark Kamler, but he told me he doesn't want to be introduced. Um, he told me I much rather should introduce the contributors to the work. Um, ah, sorry. When you guys are too fast and I forget to turn off the alert. So, 
Um, so I should rather introduce the two contributors, um, Tao Zhang, who cannot be here today, um, works in uh, Mark Kamner's group. He obtained his PhD in 2019 and um, is a postdoc there. His research focuses on phase field modeling of fracture and phase segregation of electrode materials. And the second contributor, Mark, asked me um, to mention is Mohsin Sotude. Um, he obtained his PhD in 2019 in Göttingen. Um, where he was in the SFB uh, 1073, Atomic Scale Control of Energy Conversion, and uh, is now a postdoc in Axel Gross Group, um, where he works on first principles modeling of atomistic structures and processes related to electrochemical energy storage. So he's someone on the phase field side, someone on, on the atomistic side, and now these two are being uh, put together, and uh, we hear a talk about combining 3D anisotropic phase field modeling and DFT for multi-scale modeling of sodium iron phosphate. And Mark, your time is starting whenever I have my cell phone ready, which would be now. Okay, thank you, Christian, for accepting this change of plan, so to say, because obviously I do not fit very well into this perfect lineup of early career researchers, and you mentioned the reason why. So, um, yeah, the basic idea of this work is to couple together um, uh, yeah, density functional theory and uh, phase field modeling to put up a multi, or let's say, uh, by scale uh, simulation chain. Uh, and the uh, uh, research subject here in this case was uh, sodium ion phosphate, uh, which um, shows, in contrast to its lithium counterpart, uh, quite complex uh, phase segregation behavior where we have this interesting two-third intermediate uh, phase which was shown earlier by simulation work of Tao may be occurring also because of mechanical reasons in order to reduce mechanical stresses that occur in the material during intercalation. Obviously, the volume changes here uh, in this uh, sodium iron phosphate case are significantly larger than for the well-established lithium iron phosphate material. So, um, the focus of this work was also on the interaction between microstructure evolution, microstructure evolution of the phases and the mechanics. And uh, on the side of the density functional theory part, uh, the open circuit voltage was calculated, and this is the basis for uh, adjusting the phase field potential, which describes the f uh, governs the phase segregation process, and also provide uh, calculated elastic properties, which are definitely uh, um, impossible to be obtained experimentally. And on the side of the phase field modeling, it was then the objective to uh, identify the phase, uh, the phase field model, carry out the simulations uh, showing electrochemical processes accounting for anisotropic diffusion uh, and anisotropic misfit strain, as shown on the bottom here, in contrast to simply accounting for volumetric strain and also uh, anisotropic elasticity and concentration dependence of um, elastic properties. And um, there is, we different, uh, let's say, four different scenarios were considered here um, in this matrix. Uh, I will not go into the details, don't be afraid. Um, so we have, first of all, two uh, insertion regimes, so-called surface reaction limited, meaning very low insertion rates. Um, and on the other side, uh, on the other side diffu uh, bulk diffusion limited regimes, meaning very high uh, insertion rates. And the other two um, cases were uh, accounting for completely isotropic diffusion and uh, uh, anisotropic diffusion in the case of pure 1D diffusion in 1D channels. Uh, and uh, the results can be discussed in our poster number 27. I will be there in a second. And one of the messages is that if we relax the pure 1D diffusion constraint, actually that already, uh, by only a very small amount, this already reduces the mechanical stresses occurring in these particles significantly. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Where did I leave my notes there? All right, uh, am I still on the microphone? Yeah. So, last contribution, but certainly not least, um, Ananyo Roy. He was born and raised in Calcutta in the eastern part of India. 
um, and uh, obtained a bachelor's degree in physics first, and then uh, moved to physics and materials science during his master's degree. And he's currently a third year PhD student in Max Fichtner's group. And he's going to talk to us. I'm doing this every time, right? <laughs> You should finish four minutes sharp. It would avoid a lot of problems. Well, he's going to talk to us about dual cation co-insertion in magnesium batteries. Ananio, your time is starting now. Uh, long day, right? Long day. Yeah, so uh, this is my research topic, but it's uh, uh, quite a lot of words for an end of the day session, right? So uh, I'm going to break it down, uh, break down my research topic and the strategy that I'm applying with the help of a rather uh, common scenario. Uh, so here we have like a guy, uh, let's just call him Mr. M, and he wants to climb this staircase, and he's carrying a heavy load. Uh, so it's, he's in a bit of a trouble. He needs, he needs, he is slow, and he is doing something which is extremely energy intensive, and this is something which is very, very synonymous with what happens with magnesium ion insertion when it comes to cathode materials. And that gives us uh, something like this, like a capacity which is slightly on the lower side. And uh, on top of that, we have this uh, slopey voltage profiles. Now, the reason being is that uh, magnesium being like uh, a plus two charged divalent cation, it interacts very strongly, very similar to what we see with this guy who is carrying a heavy load and needs to go up a staircase, which means he has to work against the field of gravity. So again, concept of potential energy is coming into this concept. And uh, in batteries also, we learn about uh, potentials that needs to be overcome. Uh, so how to possibly maybe counter this issue of energy intensive processes? Luckily, there is Mr. L, and he seems to be carrying a rather light load on his shoulders and has a hand free. So he decides, OK, uh, maybe I can help you out here. I can help you out with the hand. And this is what I'm trying here. Uh, I'm trying to have a monovalent ion help a bulky or rather a strongly interacting uh, multivalent ion uh, insert into cathode materials, in this case, in the climb up the staircase, let's just say. So uh, as we can see the data uh, on the, on the right and bottom corner, uh, we get like slightly better data, better capacities, higher voltages. Uh, no, this is just, I'm, I'm trivializing the whole thing here. So if you want a bit more in-depth discussion, please do visit poster number 22. That's my poster. Thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot. There was a very broad spectrum of presentations from rather scientific to rather only entertaining, but nonetheless fascinating. And now we'll come to the vote, so it's getting serious. Um, I think Christoph has prepared something. If you have a cell phone with you, which probably applies to 99% of you, it would be good if you take it out now, but you can also use your laptop. And I'd like you to either go to the web page menti.com and use the code which is displayed on the top. And you're already well prepared. I'm impressed. Or you use the QR code which was printed out in front of you. But apparently, you're already set. I don't have to explain anything. Fantastic. So how many votes do we have? 62 now. Oh, I think we need a bit more. So let's, let's see 66 now. I think we should at least reach 80 to make sure that everybody is connected and capable of 75, 76, 77, yes. That's still growing. We'll wait a bit more. Maybe some of you are still struggling. Anybody having technical difficulties? No. 81. But we are more than 81 people in the room. I think some of you are being lazy. Anyways, all right. <laughs> I planned this is like a running gag, you know. OK. So I think we're all ready. That means we'll now, oh, 90, yeah? a couple more. So but we'll, we'll move to the next que question. And we want to hide the poll now, because we just want to determine the winner. So you'll see on your cell phone now, you have the choice between the six candidates. So who is it going to be? 
which presentation did you like most? So you can give your vote right now. Anybody who still wants to vote and couldn't, you have to scream now. Otherwise, I may announce the winner in 10 seconds. Okay, everybody's happy? All right, so the winner is Li Ping. Come to the stage. Congratulations. We have some presents for you here. That's your presence for today. Wonderful. I'm very happy. And let's give the other participants also another big round of applause. Thank you very much.